the normal lecture which you would have had this morning for petroleum. So with that, I want to introduce Dr. Tennyson Jagai to come. Good morning. Today we have another lecture in the course contract law and negotiations. The course instructor is Mr. Francis Jai Paul Singh. And this is, of course, in the final term of the MNG program in petroleum engineering. The course deals with the law and regulations governing business, contract law, and how it affects all industries and every type of commercial agreement from entering into a contract to validity of purchase conditions. For this term, we have had three lectures so far. Lecture one dealt with the definition of a contract. Lecture two looked at tools and techniques for creating contracts. Lecture three, we looked at, we took an overview of contracts and enforcement of contracts. Today we have lecture four, which deals with international maritime boundaries, dispute re resolution, and negotiations. We are privileged and excited to have a very distinguished gentleman, a son of the soil, who has earned accolades for himself in the field of law to deliver this lecture this morning. Justice Amos Anthony Lucky is a legal icon, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but internationally. His educational background and professional accomplishments are impressive and cover several pages and will take a very long time for me to read them all, but I will give you some highlights. Justice Lucky served on the Magistracy of Trinidad and Tobago from 1964 to 1974. For the period 1974 to 1976, he was Acting Secretary, Law Reform Commission, Law Reform Law Commission, Trinidad. He served as a judge of the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago <clears throat> from 1987 to 2003, and as Justice of Appeal in the Court of Appeal of Trinidad and Tobago from 2000 to 2003. In 2010, he was the Ombudsman for CASET, which is the Caribbean Association Council for Engineering and Technology. In addition, Justice Lucky is a member of the Commonwealth Magistrates and Judges Association. He is a member of the Interrights Tri Tribunal, that is, the International Center for the Legal Protection of Human Rights. He is the President of the Chamber for Marine Environment Disputes and Chairman of the Board of Directors Academy of Tertiary Studies. He has several publications and delivered lectures on international law and the law of the sea. The University of Trinidad and Tobago is delighted to have <coughs> Justice Lucky with us today to enlighten us on the laws of the sea. I am certain that this lecture will be very informative and we would all gain a better understanding and appreciation of the topics to be covered. Please join with me in welcoming Justice Amos Anthony Lucky. Good morning and thank you very much, Professor Jagai, for that introduction. In fact, during the introduction, I looked to my right to see if I could be introduced to the person he was talking about. <laughs> the right, getting right down to what we have to do today, the plan for the lecture is as follows. I would personally like a lot of interaction and discussion. So from 9.10 until 10 o'clock, I will be speaking to you 
on say four topics an introduction a definition of Trinidad and Tobago and the territorial sea the continental shelf the exclusive economic zone and after that the delimitation the limitation treaty between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela after that we would have a discussion in which you can ask questions or give your views on what I've talked about. I prefer to do it this way rather than speak for a long time. Sometimes people speak for two hours and then say what questions. And the um, people abroad, I know those doing their doctorate and those doing their master said, look, we forgot what we were going to ask. So certainly I wouldn't like that to happen. The, on the slides, I would start with um, showing, let's go right back to Kingston. This here shows what Professor Jagai talked about. That's where I work. All the people you see sitting here are the judges actually in session, as we are currently doing during a case. If you want to find me, you enlarge it and look for the smallest of all, and you'll find it. This here is the court. It's the Maritime Court. We'll talk about it very briefly. Again, this is the courtroom. It holds 250 people. And this is the inside. And if you want to find me, my offices are here. This is a chateau that the Germans decided that they must keep. So I would like to start, first of all, in this by talking about the definition of Trinidad and Tobago. The Trinidad and Tobago, and I think keep this in mind because it's going to come up again later, the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago provides that Trinidad and Tobago is described as follows. Trinidad and Tobago shall comp comprise the island of Trinidad the island of Tobago and any territories that immediately before the 31st of August 1962 were dependencies of Trinidad and Tobago, including the seabed and the subsoil situated beneath the territorial sea and the continental shelf of Trinidad and Tobago. Together with such other areas as may be declared by act to form part of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, what occurred then in 1942 is that Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela, of course, we were still a colony of the United Kingdom. And when the Gulf of Paria Treaty was duly concluded, both sides, Venezuela and the Trinidad and Tobago, decided to annex the submarine areas in the Gulf of Paria as divided by the treaty to become part of the territory of Trinidad and Tobago and the territory of Venezuela. Now bear this in mind, the Venezuelan constitution says that the territory of Venezuela can never be ceded to any other country. Trinidad and Tobago doesn't say that, but that subsoil in the Gulf of Paria but if we are not only entitled, it belongs to Trinidad and Tobago. So I started by asking you to bear that in mind as we continue with this lecture. What basically happened after that is that many states began to declare territorial seas. For example, when the Gulf of Paria Treaty we go to the next, up another side. Go ahead. Yeah. One more. Oops. I'll have to go back to Kingston. 
what happened is yes, to the yeah, to the original lecture. Just bear with me for one minute. Come totally out. I got it. make this out. It's the best that I could have gotten. What happened and it is important to us is that this, this here was the original Gulf of Paria Treaty that came about in 1942. This area here was annexed to and became part of the territory of Trinidad and Tobago. The other side, Venezuela. And all of this, as you see the line going downwards, and bear that in mind, all of this based on the equidistance principle, which the maritime students would know about, was this area of Trinidad and Tobago. This here is what is known still as the Saudado Field. And at that time, there was a three mile territorial sea. What the British cleverly did, in 1935, they discovered that there was a massive oil field there, but it was in the seabed. Those of you who will be going on to diplomatic relations will know that you don't say very much. You get all your information. The British kept very quiet. And in negotiating with Venezuela, you'll see how strangely, I don't know what they did there. On the map though. Yeah, you see strangely and curiously, whoops, I keep pressing the wrong thing. Just get me to the map. Yeah, how strangely and curiously that this line didn't seem to go like towards Trinidad or it didn't go towards Venezuela. It should have gone on the equidistance principle a little bit that way. But Venezuela at that time wanted the island of Patos which the British called Bird Boat Island. Very similar to a situation happening now where the Argentinians called the Falklands the Malvidas and the British called it the Falklands. What the Venezuelans wanted is that insurgents would come from Trinidad, go here and jump off, go to Venezuela, do what they had to do and come back here. And the Venezuelans could not get hold of them. So they wanted that island. So the British cleverly negotiated and said, we'll give it to you, but we want here. And they signed the treaty, did the annexation order, and typical of Venezuela, they criticized those who agreed to the treaty when they found out immediately after World War II that Trinidad and Tobago had started exploring that area. And in 1953, Trinidad and Tobago, still then a colony, but people don't know that the first offshore platform in the world was there. Straight after, of course, the United States and others began. That platform was known as Soldado One. It is written in, in Venezuela that they, want, they were looking for the negotiators because they felt that Venezuela had given away a lot of its patrimony. And Trinidad and Tobago benefited considerably by having that treaty done, the 1942 treaty. But as you will see later on in this lecture, how to put it, Venezuela, quote unquote, got back at Trinidad and Tobago by getting our patrimony in the East Coast. So it is extremely important to understand at this stage what happened. So one moves immediately now to 
the second topic, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, known as UNCLOS. The, what had happened immediately after the war is especially the Latin American states and those facing the Pacific, Peru especially, Argentina, all of them. And then it came right up to the Latin American states in the Caribbean Sea, all began declaring territorial seas. Because with the territorial sea, you own the water and what's below. In the Pacific, those countries were going up to a territorial sea of 150 miles, some were 50, some were 60, because they felt that the big nations, especially Japan, they were coming with a big factory and stealing their fish. So they began to hold conferences. And the conferences led to several things began to happen. After the 1942 treaty, the Truman Proclamation came, in which the United States declared that the continental shelf shall be an extension of the landmass up to 200 miles or to where it admits of exploitability. Now, I think you will understand that when the United States did that, if you can exploit up to five miles, it's your continental shelf. So in 1958, there were four conventions. And in each of those conventions, dealing with the continental shelf, territorial sea, the high seas, and the contiguous zone, which was a 12-mile area outside of the 12-mile area, they defined the territorial sea to a limit of 12 miles. So what immediately happened here is that Trinidad and Tobago declared a 12-mile territorial sea, and Venezuela a 12-mile territorial sea, and Venezuela said, what is the position here? Because we have now gone 12 miles, you have come 12 miles, so what are we going to do? Because we have a 12-mile territorial sea, but the Gulf of Paria Treaty did not divide the waters. The Gulf of Paria Treaty dealt with the submarine areas. So you could have had a very strange situation um, of somebody from Cedrus going out to fish. He ends up and says, well, I am in Trinidad and Tobago water, so I'm out here. And the Venezuelan Guardia locks him up. And he says, no, I'm in Trinidad and Tobago waters. And they say, no, there's a 12 mile limit. And the Trinidadians say, well, we didn't see a boundary written. There's no line on the, on the sea. And you had these arguments, disputes, one after the other. And I'm sure that over a period of time, you all would have read of Trinidad and Tobago fishermen, up to now, still being held by the Guardia. Further, the problems came in that on Soldado 1, the Guardia would occasionally board them, board the, the platform, and have people under sort of house arrest and there'd be negotiations and complaints. So there were lots of things happening even at that stage. The, and I will show you now if we go to go back to election and to full concession map. This one. This is what happened with the extension of the 12 mile. Well, you have to go up. The area in the, the area shown here in red is what happened then. Because Trinidad and Tobago actually owned had an entitlement and it was part of the territory of Trinidad and Tobago. All up to here. It looks very small on the map, but if you live down in Cedrus, you know how big this is. And here, Trinidad and Tobago owned the subterranean, and Venezuela had the waters. So the problems began right here. Now this area will come up again. This is where the big gas fields are. And the, you will see in a later map that the boundary of Trinidad and Tobago, which is depicted in a thesis called Legal Problems with the Law of the Sea between Trinidad and Tobago 
and Venezuela, which is at the university, you will see that the author of that thesis had the line coming exactly as it is here and then going up. The, we'll come to that shortly because it included the gas fields. So the problem here was, you see it in red, but it is what is known in law now as a gray area. An area where one state has the this, this super adjacent waters and the other state happens to own and be entitled to the continental shelf. So that was, is a standing dispute, which we will come to shortly. So you had now various legal definitions coming about in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, to deal with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, I would have to be talking to you all for this, because it deals with everything. After 1958, due to the massive amount of disputes and problems, a lot of which went to the International Court of Justice, the ICJ as it's known, the various PREPCOM committees met. A distinguished son of the soil, not me, uh, Lennox Bala, <laughs> was the chief negotiator for Trinidad and Tobago. And they met in Caracas for months, and then they would go back home, and they would meet in Caracas, they met in Geneva. And it was agreed in this convention that there was too much work for the ICJ and that a court should be formed to deal specifically with maritime matters. And that's where the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which you saw flashed up earlier, that's when that court came into being. And this is known as the Constitution of the Seas because it deals with everything, the environment, the the um, exploration, exploitation, definitions, and everything that can come with it. So what you had now was a clear, in some people's view, definition of the continental shelf, a clear definition of the territorial sea, which we'll just deal with today. I won't go into a clear definition of what is an island, and clear definition of what is comprised here. What they also did in this convention, which as you will see later on, has created a bit of a problem, is what they created at that stage was the exclusive economic zone of 200 miles. Now the exclusive economic zone of 200 miles applies to every state. And the exclusive economic zone, if you have your 200 mile limit, it does not include the seabed and subsoil. It is just dealing with the super adjacent waters. That came about to stop states from just declaring their continental shelf, from seeing how far they want to go. It limited them because of what was going on. And at today's date, 165 states as states parties to the United Nations, to this convention. I know a question you all will be framing, so think about it. Why doesn't Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela go and sort out their problem? Although the, conven the meetings were held in Caracas, Venezuela and Colombia have not signed the treaty. They thought that Venezuela would, but Venezuela has not. Venezuela said that they prefer to deal with things bilaterally. So from 1942 and the Truman Proclamation, then you had the Convention on the Law of the Sea, which has stood ground since 1982. The, I mentioned the Gulf of Paria Treaty and the Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the first problem came about, and that is, a delimitation treaty between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. And the negotiations went on for a very, very long time. Finally, in 1990, there was a draft treaty. 
and the draft treaty was presented and Trinidad and Tobago sent a delegation to sign this treaty, the famous treaty of 1990. In that treaty, it is most unfortunate that Venezuela got the biggest part of the pie and it has created problems for Trinidad and Tobago. In the negotiations, Venezuela very cleverly said they wanted access because remember you have Guyana here coming up with its 200 miles. So Venezuela wanted egress into the continent, into the Atlantic. So not legally, but politically, they moved the line northwards. And you got that. And you'll see later on, this is where the Manitay field came about. So what I showed you earlier, we lost out. We could go to the next time. The next map. No, go back to the old one. Right. We lost out considerably. And now I'll show you where we lost. Pull that up. Go back to normal. No, go back to lecture. No, go back again to the big map, the big one. Yes. Now, if you could come up to here, yeah, um, this one, this one. Yeah. It will. It will take some. It will take some time to come up. You see what has happened. The line moved from here, it went up. So this is Venezuela. And these lovely gas fields that you all saw earlier, these, you see where they went to. So here and here, and at the moment here, Trinidad and Tobago boasted that we got an agreement. It happened last year. The then Minister of Energy went across to Venezuela and they signed. She was able to get Senor President Hugo Chavez to sign the agreement. He had resisted before because like a typical well, not Latin American president, he was annoyed with the then Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago who canceled a meeting at the last moment. So the senor wanted to hear nothing. It was in the Venezuelan papers. 
Then we got a new Prime Minister and a new Minister of Energy and the new Minister of Energy, then Carolyn Sikosad Lechon, went across to Venezuela and Venezuela said, all right, we will sign. And they entered into what is known as the Lauren Manatee Unitization Treaty, which is unique. It is so unique, it is the first unitization agreement between two states who share a common boundary and in which there are vital mineral resources, in this instance, natural gas. And we share it. It is such that I can mention, it is known, that last year, after the election of the UN, the new judge, Professor Attar, some of you may go to his university in Malta, some have been, Professor Attar was elected. And when he met me, he said two things. He said, I want to get a copy of your article on the contribution of Trinidad and Tobago to the development of the continental shelf, and I would like to see a copy of the Lauren Manity agreements and the unitization agreement, which is a public document, and I gave them. And the second thing he asked, which is good for Trinidad and Tobago, forget that I was the one who did it, but Trinidad and Tobago was the Prime Minister of Malta, asked if he could get the documents that he could use in negotiations with Italy because they share a common boundary. So although we lost out, we have gained internationally because of that agreement. And um, so I am being very careful not to praise anybody or to condemn anybody, but history will show that the previous regime, because of personalities, uh, did not get through with it. And another regime uh, has been able to get through with signing this agreement, which is good for us. So at this stage, you will see that at the moment, we have a nice agreement with Venezuela. And at the moment, relations are good. And occasionally, fishermen get into trouble with the Guardia. But that is not, strictly speaking, because of because they strayed and they knew what they did. I understand when I wrote my thesis some time ago, and I interviewed people in Cedros, and I will end on this note. But please remember what I said earlier. When I did that, what they basically said is that the fishermen in Cedros go up to um, the river, right up to Pernales, and they are. Typical Trinidadian, there was a private agreement where Trinidad fishermen would catch the shrimps at the mouth of the Orinoco and the Venezuelans would get the fish on our section, the kingfish and the carried. What was interesting when I interviewed them, I couldn't put this in the thesis, is that they were very clever in that they had two families, one in Pernales, one in Cedros. <laughs> And they made sure that all the children were called by the same names. So if you go down in Cedras, if you don't find people with Indian names, you find a lot of them with Spanish names, like Carlos instead of Charles and things like that, because there was a Carlos at part of Pernales. So he goes to Pernales and he tells his the, the senora there, well, I have to go to Trinidad to sell the fish. And then when he leaves Trinidad, he goes to put an Alice and he tells the Trinidad wife, I have to go there. So it was a nice arrangement. <laughs> but then, of course, came the internet. So, <laughs> the internet and Facebook. But at the moment, this treaty stands. I know there are certain questions you all want to ask. So I would take a 15 minute pause for us to have a discussion on what I have just talked about. Now feel free, disagree with me. That's and if you don't, I'm going to pick on somebody. Yes. I 
I did it with my father, I was saying. I have an instructor to give. We made the claim that we have lost out in the negotiation with Venezuela with a new treaty. And at the same time, we have been internationally. Uh, but from a resource point of view, do you not think we have lost tremendously? Particularly with respect to the exploitation of the resources in those fields where the land shifted northwards and eastwards. Uh, and I sent Robin Trinidadia to the land to make your song off and exclusive economic zone, uh, economic zone and the ability to exploit the mineral resources and so on. Yes, that's very good, Mr. Panagari Singh. Um, I trust that you were not in the Red House when that was negotiated. Well, no, 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 I was not. <laughs> <laughs> because I have to tread very carefully, but we are all academics here. It's a good question you raised, Mr. Baladari Singh, and I'll tell you why. Trinidad and Tobago, you are correct. We lost here. And you will see, and I will anticipate what I'm going to talk to further. You, you raised it and gave me a set induction. You will see how much we lost by signing that treaty, because it has affected us and it has created a cutoff effect into the Atlantic. But the negotiation uh, negotiators at that time were the, current, the then Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1990, the then Prime Minister in April 1990, and a delegation that went across to Venezuela. There were technocrats, and I speak from personal knowledge, who went to see the Prime Minister and presented a map showing the equidistance principle and what the law was the applicable law at that time, which is the, the street. It fell on their affairs because when they came back from Venezuela, they said we signed the street. Immediately thereafter, I was I was a judge. But an article appeared in the Guardian called El Tigre versus the Pussycat. But the gist of it was that you don't send a cat to negotiate with a tiger. And that is exactly what happened that the Venezuelans got the better of Trinidad and Tobago. They have not forgotten what happened in 1942. They realized they lost out then, and they wanted to get back every single thing possible. So what occurred here, and I'm answering Mr. Baladari Singh, and of course everybody else, what occurred here was a political agreement, not a legal maritime agreement. Because in a legal maritime agreement, you would have never gotten a shift. For, for, for what reason? You just move the line. Now, the law, international law, provides how you do that, how you adjust the line, what you apply. If you use the angle bisector method, use the equidistance method, or do you use the equidistance provisional measures method? But if you push that aside and you use the political method, you're not going to get what is required in the law. And the reason that was advanced when I challenged, I was brave, I was young and younger and brave in those days. I told the minister, I said, but what happened? He said, it's a question of economics. I said, what do you mean economics? He said, well, the oil companies had indicated that they were not going to do any exploration here unless they knew exactly where the boundary was. And secondly, there were leases. They had to, they had to um, tell the people who had leased that we could have it no longer. The oil companies didn't mind because a multinational company, whether it gets it from Venezuela or Trinidad, it doesn't matter for them once they are able to exploit. So he said it was economic and 
in order not to um, descend into the arena swinging fists. And I, all I said was economics. I said, well, I don't understand that. He said, what do you mean? I said, have you ever seen a one-handed econo economist? And he said, no. I said, right, because he would not be able to be an economist because they always say, on the other hand. <laughs> so if they don't have two hands, they run into problems. And I ended the conversation. But I have said it more than once that Trinidad and Tobago has lost out. And to answer your question further, in the current case, and you could have gone on the net, actually, if I had had this lecture before, I would have told you that the case between Bangladesh and Myanmar in the Bay of Bengal, which we are currently writing the judgment, Professor Crawford, who appeared for Bangladesh with Philip Sands and with Professor Boyle, among others, he raised the point and he said, Trinidad and Tobago, by signing this treaty, shot itself in the foot and created a cut-off effect, which we will talk about later. So you are very correct, Mr. Paragaxi. Yeah, so let's say you know, let me to one situation. I just want to make a comment on that. On the question of international treaties and governance within Trinidad and Tobago. International treaties do not come before the Parliament for the debate and ratification. They seem to be the domain of the cabinet and the part of the ministry. And I feel that this is a serious weakness in the governance of this country because important matters like this should be at least be debated in the parliament, views being heard before these kind of decisions are being taken. Because if this is our patrimony that has to be handed away like this, then there must be greater participation in the signing of international treaties and protocols that us this kind of agreement. Um, again, it is a good comment because the, when this treaty was signed, I think it was um, an independent senator who said, and I quote, that the, the basis for the then, um, the, the then party to have entered into that was in fact trying to cede the territory of Trinidad and Tobago. And when the 1990 treaty was discussed in Parliament, you're correct, it had to come to Parliament for ratification. And if any of you can read Spanish, this is a book that was presented to me by Professor Morales Paul, now deceased, but I met him in Venezuela in 2006. And you know, the he spent two pages in dealing with what occurred in the Parliament. Good point that you made, where the signing of this treaty was severely criticized. And he spent a lot of time stating that the then Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, in effect, criticized the signing of that 1990 treaty. The name that has appeared here, then Prime Minister Patrick Manning, speaking in 1991, criticized in Parliament the signing, the ratification of that treaty. It was ratified. And when they ratified the treaty, they completely forgot, and I think it's Senator Amol Singh Mahabir raised it um, in the Senate some years ago, when she said they completely forgot that the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago includes the submarine areas in the Gulf of Paria. And we had, by signing that treaty, we didn't give it away, but we have created an anomaly. So treaties must and should be ratified. Yes. Sorry, I beg your Venezuela? No. Venezuela, surprisingly, to most of the negotiators, um, one of whom recently, very recently, has retired as a judge, um, Judge Yankov, 
Yankov is from Bulgaria. He was spent a lot of time in Venezuela, and they were all extremely disappointed when they all appeared in Montego Bay to sign, and Venezuela did not sign. Venezuela did not sign because Colombia did not sign. And Venezuela did not become a state party because in 1982, they still had problems with Trinidad and Tobago. They have with Guyana. They have with Aruba. They have with Curaçao. They have with Colombia. And on the land, they have with all their neighbors. So they have not signed because if and you'll see when we deal with compulsory jurisdiction, you will see that if you are a state's party to the convention and a matter comes up, then a procedure follows. And if you agree to the jurisdiction, then you are bound by the decision that comes out. So Venezuela has not signed it. Um, a lot of people are still hoping for example, it was surprising everybody. The United States supported the convention, but they are not a state's party. But they are always there. They are always there with big contingents. And I witnessed it myself in June last year when there was the election of the seven judges. Every three years, seven judges have to go and they can seek re-election. And the United States was very present, but they didn't have the right to vote. But they had the right to influence. But they are not a state's party. Venezuela is not a state's party. Colombia is not a state's party. Canada recently became a state's party. This is my question. How does the tribunal of the late, let's say, Barbados and Andes claim for existence, yet not within this 1993 treaty, the Okay. Um, I'm happy with it. I'm coming to it shortly, but I'll just give you a brief answer. That Guyana, Barbados, and Trinidad and Tobago are all states parties. And when we deal with the Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago arbitration, which is a decision we have to abide by. The Trinidad and Tobago, I think I'm going into the other part of the lecture, but Trinidad and Tobago was called unawares. You see, if you do not state to the Secretary General your choice of procedure, and you're a state's party, and another state's party files an action, you are deemed under the law to have accepted arbitration. So even though both Prime Minister, well, our Prime Minister then was going to meet the Prime Minister of Barbados, and I'll deal with it in more detail in the next, after the um, discussions, well, well, let me deal with it now. What basically happened was this. Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados were trying to arrive at an agreement, at a delimitation. There was also a fishing problem, which was not being dealt with. Trinidad and Tobago then, in 2003, were negotiating with Barbados and with Grenada, but more so with Barbados, to arrive at a boundary by agreement. In September 2003, and I can't say this. I was elected. When I was up there, one of the colleagues came to me and he said, when you go back home, do not discuss Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados because it's likely that the case will come to us. You will not be affected because if a party doesn't have a judge, they can nominate an ad hoc judge. So I said, why? He said, because Pr um, Attorney General Mia Motley has been here negotiating with the President and speaking to him about filing an action, which took me by surprise. So he said, don't talk about it. But as a diplomat, 
which he was a senior diplomat, whispered quietly that something's coming. So I came back and did my duty and met the then minister and I said, you know, Barbados is going to file. And it suggested that we have a choice of procedure whereas we are going to find ourselves in the arbitration, which is an expensive thing. And he said, no, look outside. There are the negotiators and they are preparing to go to Barbados on Thursday. I was speaking to them on Monday. I said, well, do it. They said, no, no, we have lovely relations. In fact, the ticket for the Prime Minister is now here with us, and the Prime Minister said, you to meet on Thursday. And on Wednesday at 1 o'clock, Barbados five. So the Prime Minister didn't go again. They informed that they had chosen two arbitrators, and they told Trinidad that they would choose two. And we'd agree on number five, and we couldn't do anything. Two years later, we put a choice of procedure. So we had to go to arbitration. There was no way out. We went to arbitration, and the arbitral committee met, and you would like to know that the total cost of the arbitration came up to 25 million US dollars, which was shared between Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. And this was a point raised by the opposition when Prime Minister Wainasa lost that they accused me of be wasting Barbados money because 25 million would pay the budget of our court for at least five years. So it's an expensive thing. And you will see later on how with the combination of this treaty and as Mr. Barry Singh correctly raised, what happened with Guyana's extension and Barbados extension, we have been cut off, well, so they think, into the Atlantic. Okay? I'll leave a little bit later. Yes? That answers your question? Yes, Hi, I'm Harrison. Um, not a question, but a comment, really, to know, for perhaps clarification when we get into the Almighty um, Unitization Agreement. But in light of the fact that we keep hearing we have just 10 years of reserves available, I would have thought that having some access via a joint agreement with Venezuela is better than not having any access to gas resources, especially in light of the fact that we have a facility in Atlantic Energy to feed. So, I'd like to get some clarification with respect to that in further discussions. Yeah, well, just, just to go into your point, you're correct. It is better to have something than nothing. And the, um, oh, let me make it clear. As a judge, I am apolitical. I'm just dealing with situations. What has happened when it occurred, I rejoiced because I felt it was a good thing that we were getting something. But you hit on another point, and it won't be part of this lecture, but I'll touch on it. The question of, I don't know if you read the book, Peak Oil. There's a book called Peak Oil, where they said oil has peaked, not in price, but they've reached a point where they are not finding any more on land, and they've reached a further point where within the limits of the continental shelf, they, there's nothing more. They are now going into the outer limits, and that's why we see shortly why we need to get into the Atlantic. The further to that, if you've been flying recently over Canada, where I saw, over the Netherlands and Germany, where I have to pass all the time, and you look down, you would think there are about a hundred children with windmills because they are using wind power. And in the Netherlands, solar power. And I am um, just to this a little bit for senior lecturer, Professor Chagai, but some three years ago, two of the three of our 
colleagues, but everybody is well versed, who are the top men in pipelines, in renewable energy, and in solar energy, and who have lectured. And in fact, um, this particular judge told me he even ended up in the Antarctic. And um, was most amused. He's a German, but he said, you know, I play cricket in the Antarctic. And I asked him how you held the bat. <laughs> and, um, but they have gone there. And that's why you see that now they are going all over into the Arctic, where there's a dispute, pending dispute between Canada, the United States, Soviet Union, all the countries around there. Down in the Malvidas Islands, or Falklands, as you English might want to say, um, they began form. So they are looking on the outer side because oil has peaked. But why I mention this judge, he said he's willing to come to Trinidad and deliver lectures on um, renewable energy, on pipelines, on oil, on exploration, exploitation. And I said, well, he has been granted the highest honor in Germany. And I said, well, sure. And I was then speaking to, years ago, to Professor Julian. And he said, sure, look at him, what's his fee? And he said, his fee is arranged for me to have five lectures, and I will do it free of charge. Just pay my, pay my air passage. But it never came to pass. But you raised a good point. We have to start looking, and that's what they are saying abroad. You have the sun, you have the wind. How come you don't have any wind energy or solar energy? But I suppose we wait until the oil runs out. <laughs> yes? Certainly. Well, I love for my colleagues to ask contribution. We have an organization in the Caribbean called CARICA. We have advanced the position in terms of moving from separate states to what is called coordination and so on, foreign policy. Why was it necessary? Yes, go ahead. For Barbados, California. Yes. Take from the land and move to your court. Are there no other mechanisms within the CARICOM uh, family to deal with these Stop. questions of boundary uh, conflicts and disputes? Because that would have seemed to be quite a drastic move. Two people in two, two organizations in CARICOM, two countries, uh, taking each other to the, to the court to settle this matter. What? What is the sort of weakness you think that the CARICOM um, entity suffers in the light of not being able to remedy some yeah. of the problems that we have to take all the issues man. outside the region and yeah. such yeah. I'll answer you now. Just go to the first one. Can answer the first one? But then, uh, come on, I'll show you the other one. I'm going to answer this question about uh, two topics. This map is, you see, the whole CARICOM region. In his book, Columbus and Castro, Dr. Eric Williams wrote that geographically, we are united. Geographically, if we all got together, if you look at it together, and we all have continental shells and 200 mile limits, we can lock off the Caribbean Sea. But politically, we are divided. Now you asked about Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados. The historians among us will know that in colonial days, there was no lateral negotiations. Everything had to go to the colonial office and back. With a new breed 
of politicians throughout the Caribbean, the new breed is coming in and they are thinking more of political, of some sort of unity, CARICOM. But even with that, those of us who are out there in the international field will see that petty jealousies still exist. And in the matter with Barbados, with all due respect to the Barbadians, Barbados was negotiating with us, and yet they caught us on our made arrangements, and took us to an arbitral, um, an arbitral tribunal comprising of all Europeans. And the main lawyers were Europeans. Although the then Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago and the Attorney General of Barbados both made appearances. It seems to me, and feel free to disagree, that many of us in the Caribbean and many Trinidadians, and I'll put it back as a question, why haven't we agreed to the CCJ? Why are we still going to the Privy Council when the Privy Council itself is saying we can't cope with your appeals because England is moving to the European Court of Justice and now they are even putting Court of Appeal judges to sit on our appeals. So to put it quite simply as I we were having over coffee we actually, when I tell my brother and my wife and others, they go, I said, I, up there I work from 9 until 6.30, with of course a break for lunch, when you still talk about what you're doing, and coffee breaks when you're still discussing what you're doing. But I had to tell them at one, uh, one chance, why? You're a republic. How come you still go to the Great Council? I said, look, if you want to I give you the answer, but you know, it's political, you have to make the decision. And then they kept, you know, at it. I said, we still think that we are not good enough. That they, and I'll put it crudely because they were all white there. I said, we still think the white man is the best thing. Whereas, there are many in the Caribbean who are as bright, as brilliant, and as knowledgeable and or more than the Privy Council judges. And I'll pick up one example, Michael de Lavastide. Michael de Lavastide is one of the most brilliant men we've had around. Um, former Chief Justice Simmons, who's currently sitting in the tribunal here, David Simmons, another brilliant man. You go now to Guyana and you have Carl Singh, and these people. You go to Jamaica and you find so we have. But we still think, well, let's go there. The second part of your question is, we do have the CCJ, but the Caribbean Court of Justice cannot deal with international matters relating to the law of the sea because we have all signed the convention. And until they amend the law to give them that jurisdiction, we would have to go to the, to the tribunal, which is in fact, and this should help you, in our tribunal, actually we are called the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which annoys quite a lot of us. Judge Chandra Sika Rao said it's a mouthful, but the ICJ was objecting to us being called the Maritime Court because the ICJ still has this little jealousy that they want all the law of the sea cases. Um, but this court was established, and why we have 21 judges is that each geographical region must have a certain amount. For example, Caribbean and Latin America must have at least three. You could, you could have four. Eastern Europe, three. Western Europe, three. Asia, five. Africa, five. So you have a hodgepodge of judges coming there who have to be versed in the law of the sea, but each coming with a civil law background or a common law background 
or um, well, as they say, you even have uh, judges from communist countries, from Soviet Union. Uh, my good friend, Judge Ling Hao Gao of China. So you have this group meeting, and they feel that this would be beneficial because the majority of us are from third world countries. From Africa, the moment you have six. From Asia, you have five, that's 11. And from Caribbean and Latin America, you have four. So 15 of us are from third world countries and the rest come from Eastern and Western Europe. So it's a good group. And just to answer another question, if the Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago case had come to us, um, I can ask anybody how much you think it would have cost Trinidad and Tobago. Even if they got their best lawyers, it would have cost Trinidad and Tobago, if it cost Trinidad and Tobago one million dollars, it would have been a lot. It has cost Trinidad and Tobago over 15. Because as um, Judge Mensah of Ghana said, they don't usually call us by first name unless you really get close. And he said, Jeff Lucky. And I went to him. And then he put his hand around me and he says, Anthony, if you get an appointment as an arbitrator, then you can print your own money. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> being a judge, I said, Judge Lenson, you, you're asking me to commit a, a criminal offense? He says, no. What I mean by printing your own money is an arbitrator gets, if he's in Washington, five hundred US per hour and if they're sitting in London 500 pounds an hour and they sit for five hours every day and they usually take about two to three months to do the arbitration so <laughs> one colleague told me he said I said but how come you have an apartment in New York and one in Las Vegas, but not in the city itself, on the outskirts, and in Hyderabad. And he said, didn't you know? I was appointed an arbitrator. <laughs> and I used the money that I got to purchase these places. So arbitration is an expensive thing. But if you're appointed an arbitrator, then you can print your own money. <laughs> Any other questions? We, we have time because uh, we take the coffee break at 10.30. Yes? proceedings in the case between Bangladesh and Myanmar. It is an interesting point and the court has dealt with it and in due time you see the majority opinion but what happens in such a case under this the law to see the United Nations Convention what they try to do in those circumstances is to get the two states to cooperate and suggest to them cooperate or to come to some sort of agreement. If you can't, well, you go to the court and the court is going to have to decide something. And what would appear would be what I showed you there earlier, these gray areas. And if it comes to a court, a court will have to say two things go and cooperate and come to an agreement. And if the states say, we don't want that, we've been negotiating for years, give us a decision. Then, as we say, 
and this is just my personal opinion. The regime of the continental shelf was there. It has always been. In the North Sea continental shelf cases, they mentioned quite clearly is that the entitlement to the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, which is a natural promulgation of the land mass of a state, that that is an entitlement. It has always been there. And further, they went on to say, is that the land and the prolongation of the land into the continental shelf is the entitlement of the coastal state. That existed from 42 to the Truman Proclamation, 1958, and the exclusive economic zone only came into being in 1982. That having come about in 1982, what they said in the convention is that if there's a dispute, then there's a procedure to follow. And the procedure is the same as with the continental shelf. So it has been argued by one side that since the continental shelf has been there first, then super adjacent waters should be part of the land. And I think those of you who are dealing with the law will remember the saying that we all lived in Trinidad, quick quit plantato solo sweet, solo shady. And cases come up all the time where people put their house on the land and the owner of the land says, okay, you've been renting, you can leave. And they say, what about my house? And they say, well, if you could take it up and carry it away, go ahead. But it has become part of the land once it's affixed. And it's a principle that is being argued now. So what Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela did um, last year when they signed the unitization treaty and the one over there involving the Lauren Manatee field and they are looking at others, Grenada wants to have something similar, then through cooperation you share. And that is why I think it's a good thing. But of course, to reach to that point, I can tell you it takes a long time of negotiations. Yes. The person next to you wants to ask me something. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Um, Justice Lucky, the Gulf of Mexico is a very active foreign territory. Um, I know that you, you said that the USA is not a signatory of this court. Yeah. But um, we have the US producing and drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Plus, you have Mexico on the western side of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they are also actively producing oil. We never heard about any um, Garden National thing moving into there to, to clean territory. But how do these two countries um, settle, how did they settle on that difference in the, the ownership of the subsurface? And I also want to pose that question to what we see on the map there because currently there's a Chinese rig drilling and exploring for oil between Cuba and US territory. Is there any sort of agreement on that? Good question. What basically happens here is that that rig, as I understand it, belongs to the Shanghai or a Chinese oil company. The Chinese oil company would have entered into a lease arrangement with either Mexico, well most probably with Mexico because the United States have their own. And whatever they are exploiting there, they would was pay the necessary taxes or whatever. But a Chinese rig or a rig from anywhere just cannot go there and drill. It's not China per se doing it, it's a multinational company. So that multinational company would have to do what Exxon and Shell and BP and all of them did with us. They go into a lease arrangement with the state. 
And in that lease arrangement, they will state what happens. I think I'll come to it shortly, what law applies. But the United States and Mexico have come to a bilateral agreement where the boundaries are. And if there's a dispute, then they will have to agree as to how they will resolve it. Because the United States had one with Canada. Canada is a state party, the United States is not. And this involved the Gulf of Maine, and they divided the area by arbitration. Now the big states love arbitration. And think of it as we know. If you have an arbitration between two countries, one country picks two. And they will certainly, unless they're stupid, pick two people who would be favorable to them. The other side chooses two who they feel would be favorable to them. And both sides agree to number five, the fifth. If they cannot agree, then the law provides that they come to the president of our court and he will select the fifth, which has happened recently. He selects the fifth, but they can't agree. And as one of my colleagues put it quite bluntly, he said, if they come to us, you have 21 judges. If you want to win, you have to, and he used the word, you see how to bribe 11. And that's difficult. Because we are independent men of the highest honesty and integrity. And they find you're not, they throw you out. So that's impossible. But he said with an arbitration, all you have to get is number five. You have to get one more. <laughs> and this is why Venezuela is so reluctant to these international claims. Because, as you know the story, when I went to Venezuela, they took me into a room about this big in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And imagine that wall and that wall filled with maps of Venezuela. And I looked at it and I said, Where's Guyana? But they said, oh, that little area up there. <laughs> because really, the British just went on in one little spot, which I remember my, my brother and will remember my grandmother saying, oh, she died, she was from Guyana. She used to go to Demarara, which was a little piece. And they went, the British went in and in. So they went to arbitration. And if you look at the um, American Journal of International Law, and you see the articles written by the Venezuelans. The Venezuela being, well, you have to look at it in the turn of the 20th century. They were a poor country and they didn't have international judges. So they told the United States to choose the fifth judge. And the United States chose a Russian judge who the Venezuelans said, was fetid and wined and dined in this house in Kent, in England, and he went in favor of the, of the, of the UK, and that's how they got Guyana. So they were saying, virtually, the Russian judge was bribed. And that's filtered down to the why Senor Chavez is still annoyed with the United States. So they go right back to, the, to those things. And um, so with arbitration, I am anti-arbitration. I feel that the cases should come to the full court. And if I may give an example, we take a court break in two minutes. In this case that's currently before us, where we are writing the judgment, Bangladesh was going to arbitration. And for a reason they told me about, they switched around, they don't want arbitration again, they're coming to the full court. So they've come to the full court of 21 judges, and since they didn't have a judge, they nominated one. And Myanmar not having a judge, they nominated. So when you saw that big lineup, it's 23 of us sitting. And 23 of us trying to arrive at a judgment. So, and yet, they don't have to pay us. We are paid by the state parties through the United Nations. So, um, you don't have to worry about paying the judges. You don't have to worry about paying the registrar. You don't have to worry about paying the staff. You don't have to worry about anything. You just send your lawyers there. 
and they immediately get chambers and the case is now where we are. Those of you who came from Chagarama support of Spain, got your visas and we will come down to <laughs> pass the Academy Bridge. Uh, I, I usually like to show these, you know, the Port of Spain port, the Chagaramas, the LNG, Southeast Coast, Methanol Holdings. Somebody asked, um, why do we need so much gas, natural gas? And of course, um, when I was dealing with, if I'm ever invited back again to talk about the environment, um, I do did show those. Now, I brought up this slide here because for the bit, I see how fast I could go for discussions, and we came to international maritime border disputes. And the first thing I think I should talk about is the method that is applicable with respect to these disputes. Now, the, um, just to let you all know, somebody asked the question, are there any honest people in Trinidad and Tobago? <laughs> well, <laughs> I was elected for nine years, and um, they said there are none. So I said, don't say that too loud, they'll fire me, because <laughs> they'll be high strung and recognize competence in the field of the law of the sea. But, um, and go down for that. So you asked about the um, compulsory procedures and tailoring binding decisions. And whenever, any time whatsoever, I brought up this slide, a state is entitled to choose its method of procedure. So you'll see there the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the Annex 6, the International Court of Justice, an arbitral tribunal with Annex 7, or a spe special tribunal. What happens, and I'll show you later on, that a state party, and this is what happened to Trinidad, to a dispute not covered by a declaration, shall be deemed to have accepted arbitration. So when Barbados decided that it was going to bring arbitral tribunals, and they filed the action, there was nothing Trinidad and Tobago could have done as a state party. It was bound to go to arbitration. So there we found ourselves in that position. Of course, they have since changed that. This is on compulsory um, release of vessels and crews, and that could be another long lecture. So what we come to is this. This is the method. Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago are all states parties. Barbados, believe it or not, has not stated its choice of procedures yet. Neither has Guyana. Although, as somebody raised, if CARICOM is really strong, and we go in with one voice, CARICOM is powerful, the Caribbean states. Because in my state, in, uh, in when I was going up for the election, and as I'm, one of our people here would know, I find going up for an election is a terrible experience. Especially when you have to go and address a crowd and tell them that you're good. <laughs> Which I had to do at the UN. And, um, I think the only thing that brought the house down is I told them when I was elected a judge, I got a unanimous vote. So you could have dropped a pin because it's 162 people. Um, they said unanimous. I said, yes, there were five people and all voted for me. <laughs> That's the Judicial and Legal Service Commission. Now, what started out here is that Barbados, having filed this action in 2003, then Barbados and Guyana came to an accord, an agreement of the 2nd of December 2003, even while the proceedings were going on. They, they did it, suppose, on the advice of their lawyers, for joint cooperation in the area where their exclusive economic zones have overlapped. And this was quietly signed while the arbitration was pending. 
and it was quietly signed because of what was going to happen. So Barbados and Guyana, believe it or not, in 2003, 13 years after, filed an objection to the 1990 Trinidad and Tobago Venezuela Treaty. The reason is that you saw in the delimitation line how far out we went. Venezuela has said they couldn't care less about it, wonder about the words, because that's an agreement between two states. They have not done anything. Barbados, as I told you, they were consulting international lawyers from 2003, while Trinidad and Tobago was still in the process of negotiating. And, well, I suppose we are such law-abiding and nice people that I remember the verse when they did it from Shakespeare. You know, the heights of great men reach a map were not attained by sudden flight. By day, but they, while their companions slept, were working assiduously in the night, which is what Abidas did while we were playing carnival. Um, so, the, as I told you, how the action was filed and was taken us completely unaware. So, what basically happened is they came to an agreement. Trinidad tried to argue that there was a concavity and as a result, they should have drawn a straight line. Oops. They should have drawn a straight... Where did I have it? Oops. I went too fast. Yes, they should have drawn a straight line from there straight to here in this concavity and then draw the lines upwards. But the arbitral tribunal did not agree with that. What basically happened was the, and I'll go back up now to the, you see, for example, here with Dominica, they entered into an agreement with France on behalf of Martinique. You see how they were cut off and boxed in. But they were able to get an agreement here through a bilateral agreement which gives Dominica access to the Atlantic, which is what they wanted. Having gotten that, now Trinidad and Tobago, on the other hand, we found ourselves in a bit of a straight jacket. Um, I may have to go back up here. Oops. Don't move me. I just wanted, oh yes, I wanted to show you this first. Here we have that arbitral award. Could get bigger? Right. What they did is Trinidad and Tobago, way back in 1973, when uh, Carl Hudson Phillips QC was then the Honorable Attorney General. He intervened in, Gen in Geneva and he said Trinidad and Tobago is a small archipelago. And we later passed a law declaring that we were an archipelagic state. It meant that our here goes to here, here goes straight to Tobago, down to here, down to Cyprus and across. That big coastline. It, the decision has been criticized by writers saying that the, the arbitral tribunal will not recognize the length of the Trinidad and Tobago coast compared to that. So the Trinidad and Tobago, that was the Trinidad and Tobago claim. And this here was the Barbados claim. And uh, a colleague of mine said in a Bayesian action, when he saw that, he said, I find it false. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, really, look, look where they came, right on the point E. Trinidad and Tobago wanted to go 
from A here to B, which sounds satisfactory. Like what really happened is they used the media line principle, but they measured it from the table. They forgot about there. And they came to the conclusion that they went out to a line way out here. So we found ourselves, Trinidad Tobago, that is, in a bit of a straight jacket. I showed you that, what they did, the argument here. Now, what happened is this. This is the old boundary. You see where the equidistance line moved up, and it went that way. Guyana started coming up from their boundary line in Venezuela this way. And the 200-mile limit from Barbados was here. So in effect, what was happening is we were being boxed in. And the crown it oil, to answer the questions, what happened here was this. They took the boundary line, moved it up to here. So Venezuela could have access into the Atlantic through that area. In the meantime, Barbados and Guyana signed their accord from this point down to here and Guyana up to there. So Trinidad and Tobago looking for access into the Atlantic found itself in a cut off and squeezed position. And that's where we have unfortunately, or Trinidad and Tobago has at found unfortunately found itself. The Trinidad and Tobago now is looking to see how it could find itself into the outer limits of the continental shelf. So if we could go back now to the original, right back up to the Kingston. No, just take it completely off. If you could go to the uh, new concession map, where is that? The old concession upstream, yeah, upstream. Now, if you look on the board, what I showed you earlier, this is the current upstream map that is issued on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago. See what has happened? We have gone into a nice triangle here. And these are areas that are leased. These are open areas. We can no longer go down this way. So it is pointing out how Trinidad and Tobago, through the accord with Barbados and Guyana and the 1990 treaty we have been boxed in and cut off from the Atlantic. So if we could go to the next one. Or can I control from here? Hmm? Next one. Now I have come back deliberately to the old concession map to, to let you, for, for, um, unfortunately I can't put the two next to each other, but you will see what happened from here, we went there. And this was in 1990 agreement. Now the question was asked, can we come out of it? You know the only way we can come out of it? I recall a film I brought on like that, I like the Peter Houston off, it was called The, the Mouse That Roared. A little country declared war against the United States. So, we could declare war against Venezuela <laughs> and tell them, look, we want it back after we conquer them. 
there's, there's no way. We have to abide by it. There's no way out. And in fact, as I was saying during the coffee break, the Venezuelans have highly publicized uh, Jesse Noel's doctoral thesis. They also published this mine, <laughs> but in which he said, Trinidad Island Provincia de Venezuela. So they only print the headline, Trinidad Island Province of Venezuela. But he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about Spain giving Venezuela the administrative responsibility for Trinidad. So I brought this out to show you how we have lost that patrimony which we can never get back, except that somebody rightly raised, it was better to get something than nothing in the Lauren Manity Agreement. So. Okay, now I wanted to talk to you briefly about what is known as a gray area. It's a new term and the gray area occurs as I show you in that red area on the early map where one state has its entitlement to the continental shelf and the other state is entitled to the super adjacent waters. The Trinidad and Tobago in my humble opinion played a significant role in cutting itself off. It was a sort of automatic cutoff by agreeing with Venezuela to a delimitation that materially departed from the equidistance to Trinidad and Tobago's detriment. The difference between the Venezuela, Trinidad and Tobago equidistance line and the agreed line was shown on the map. And the arbitral tribunal referred to it saying that Barbados, Barbados cannot be required to compensate Trinidad and Tobago for agreements it made by shifting its maritime boundary with Venezuela. If Trinidad and Tobago had not made the concession to Venezuela, it would have had a potential outlet to the area beyond 200 miles that it now seeks to have. At that time, it had not made a submission. It has now made a submission to the Commission on the Outer Limits of the Continental Shelf. They are um, that commission comprises geologists, geophysicists, geomorphologists, and, and they deal with and scientific people. You have to prove to them that you are entitled to the outer limits by scientific evidence. What therefore, one would ask, is the scientific evidence for Trinidad and Tobago? So, Barbados has said openly, and it was publicized, Trinidad and Tobago has no claim. Trinidad and Tobago has made a claim. I understand in doing the research for this lecture that the lawyers in the Ministry of Energy and in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have said that we do have, and we do have an argument for that. My own view is perhaps will be controversial in that I say we do. Because the definition that the states arrived at for a definition of the continental shelf, instead of being two paragraphs, it's 10. So they have said that your continental shelf is a natural prolongation of the landmass under the sea going out to a limit. And if you permit me, as I say the lawyers say, always walk with your book. You see, the 
continental shelf of a coastal state comprises the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that extend beyond its territorial sea, so beyond 12 miles, throughout the natural prolongation of the land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. But then they go on in two to say that it shall not extend beyond the limits provided by paragraphs four to six. And in four to six, it tells you again that the line delineated in accordance with paragraph seven deals with sedimentary rock. And further in five, it says, the fixed points comprising the line of the outer limits of the continental shelf on the seabed drawn in accordance with paragraphs 4a, 1, and 2 shall either shall not exceed 350 nautical miles from the baseline from which a territorial sea is measured or shall not exceed 100 nautical miles from the 2,500 meter isobar, which is a line connected the depth of 2,500 meters. So, in the light of all these arguments, you've got a hodgepodge of some people telling you, well, natural prolongation is set out here, it's a legal definition. But you can't get a legal definition unless you go to science. So the argument for Trinidad and Tobago, re Barbados, is you have a legal continental shelf. In the arbitration, they said there's one continental shelf and they are going to 200 miles out to there with their EEC. Trinidad and Tobago, you have to take that it's an archipelago. And if you measure its continental shelf, this is just my view, you are going from here straight and from here straight. What you are basically happening now is you are crossing an area here at what we call a gray area, and with Guyana, you are crossing another gray area there. Now, the continental shelf regime existed long before the regime that involved the exclusive economic zone. And when it comes to the limitation of the exclusive uh, economic zone, and the definition of the exclusive economic zone, it says here quite clearly that the rights set out in the article with respect to the seabed and subsoil shall be exercised in accordance with part six, which deals with the limitation. And it says here that sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting and conserving and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, of the waters super adjacent to the seabed and the seabed and its subsoil and with regard to other activities, economic exploitation, etc. So in the EEZ, you deal with the resources in the sea, not in the seabed. That is the state's continental shelf. And if you are going to delimit that area, then you have to delimit it in accordance with Article 83, which says the delimitation of the continental shelf between states with opposite or adjacent coast shall be effected by agreement on the basis of international law, as referred to in Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, in order to achieve an equitable solution. So whoever the judges are, they have to see how they can arrive at an equitable solution. So the argument, presumably, that the distinguished and learned gentlemen in various ministries are using, they are saying, well, in these circumstances, you have to apply the definition and the rights to the continental shelf have always existed. Those rights cannot be taken away. And in the circumstances, Trinidad and Tobago had its entitlement to a continental shelf long before the regime of the exclusive economic zone came into being. And further, in international law, to support my argument, the accepted principle in international law is that the land 
dominates the sea throughout the projection, the projection of the coast or the coastal fronts. And that's what they said in the famous North Sea continental shelf cases between Germany and Denmark and the Netherlands and Germany. And what the court said is the land is the source of the power which a state may exercise over its territorial extensions seaward. So natural prolongation of the land territory tells you that it's an uninterrupted seabed geology and geomorphology substantiated by geo geological and geographic, sorry, geomorphologic continuity from the landmass into the Atlantic Ocean. So, this here is the continent. This island here we love so much is part of the continent and therefore the continental shelf will go out past this cutoff area. They can have the cutoff area and the cutoff area results in that we are also going out 200 miles. So they have to delimit the EEZ as well. But you see, in the Barbados case, Trinidad and Tobago has and is bound by that decision. And in that decision, I personally feel that they went a little bit too far. I don't know if we could pull up. I want to show you the, the, the award. Um, <coughs> Barbados, not sorry now. The Barbados one, yeah. The, I just pulled up the basic award and we go down. Hold it a sec. Tribble, chosen by Barbados. Brownlee, chosen by Barbados. Sir Arthur Watts and Orega, chosen by Trinidad. Of course, he was the agreed by both sides, and Tribble was the president. This is the arbitral tribunal. And um, I don't know if anybody knows, he's not from the Caribbean. Ian Brownlee, QC, English. Vaughan Lowe, English. Arthur Watts, English. Professor Akula, Spanish. So we had a group of Europeans with European lawyers deciding the fate of Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. So Mr. Paradari Singh we chose that. So you get what you choose. And that's what happened to us. And we bound by the decision. If you could scroll down. Yeah, go down. Okay, as they put it, they did positive, which is the decision. They said they had jurisdiction to limit the maritime boundary of the shelf. They had jurisdiction in respect of the maritime boundary relation of the continental shelf extending beyond 200 nautical miles. And that while they had that, the fishing problem, they said they had no jurisdiction and they are directing Trinidad and Tobago to determine who should own what. So if we could go down some more. That is the boundary in a series of geodectic lines joining the parties and the claims of the parties inconsistent with the boundary that I showed you all later are not accepted. So if we could come up to here now, you will see what they did. And in the firm decision, what they did here is they brought the line to this point and then they went that way as you saw earlier. So in that, although it was claimed by the then Attorney General and the then Prime Minister and the then Foreign Minister that we won, 
in fact, we lost. So not only do we, or had we in the past, been losing a cricket to Barbados, mm -hmm. we also lost in the sea. So <laughs> that is the basis of it. The okay, so we could come out. Just go down. Let me see something. Yeah. If you come out again. I'm just trying to sort out a, a, a map I'm looking for. The, yes. That's the last one. Um, no. come, come out of it. Come out. Um, go to go to IR lecture. Right. That. See what Come right down. Two. There's a map I'm looking for. Yes. That. You see where the two claims are. Go to the next one now. They rejected both and they came to their own and brought it down to here. So you see what basically happened to us. The arbitral tribunal went to an They should have stopped here, but they went further. And having gone further, well, where do we go? Guyana has come up there with the 200 mile. But as I said, a, there is an argument that we have access to the outer continental shelf. That's where we have to go if we want to really find out what <laughs> the resources are and if we do want resources there. Because in the deep sea there, as you know, which is another long lecture, when you hear of these mounds and the various things that they are finding, and when the films that we saw in Beijing last year when you go up to five miles deep, there are manganese deposits and iron and various things the size of footballs. And what they are doing is scraping it and pulling it up. But in doing so, they are destroying all the various mounds that took 5,000 years to develop. So the scientists are saying they have to be extremely careful about going into that outer, into the deep sea area. Once you get into the deep sea area, then you have the question of the landlocked states. Because the landlocked states are saying that when you reach the outer limits of the continental shelf, then they are also entitled to what is in the deep sea. And that is why in Jamaica, you have the Seabed Authority. And the Seabed Authority is dealing with all these various companies that are doing the mining. But then they are asking the question, how do you monitor it? And when they get what they get, how do you divide it among all the states? So that is still being strongly deliberated. So as you see, there are gray areas out and gray areas in the Gulf of Paria and the Serpent's Mouth. So just before I go on to the next topic, um, I want to know if you have any questions on what I've just talked about. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Your international tribunal and the such as this, do they not themselves see some of the flaws and gray areas and advise that because I mean, it would seem to me from what you are saying, it is because of the craftiness of the countries involved, they have arrived at more or less this position 
with Barbados, they can take play in that way, and so it's Venezuela. But when, if you are on an international tribunal and you look at the geography, you see that. So Trinidad is going to become landlocked. Is there not some kind of residual uh, authority within the tribunal that says something seems to be a mistake? It is a good point. Shelf, where both Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados have made submissions. If there is a disagreement or if Trinidad and Tobago has the right under the Act to say we don't accept that, we don't accept what you're giving us. So the only way the CLCS, as it's called, is not a court. It makes recommendations and the coastal state can say we don't accept the recommendation. If both states don't accept the recommendations made by the CLCS, then the matter could be brought to the, our court, as the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or to the ICJ. They can't go to arbitration because I don't think Trinidad and Tobago will ever agree to an arbitration again. They would either go to the ICJ or they would come to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So this is the point where we have reached, where in discussing the, the Commission on the Outer Limits of the Continental Shelf, to have that fixed, the only way that decision is accepted is if the court Celsius says, yes, we accept what you're giving us. So if the government of Trinidad and Tobago sees the report of the CLCS and say, we accept your recommendation, there's nothing you can do about it. If the government says, we don't, then the CLCS can, the, the Commission on the Outer Limits cannot compel you. And if Barbados says not, they can't compel you. So what I basically see here with Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, and it takes a long time, my term ends in nine years, so perhaps one of you will sit as a judge nominated by Trinidad and Tobago, and you will be able to make a positive contribution. So that is where it can. In other words, it's not cast in concrete. It is still pending. And one of the reasons that was raised by Bangladesh in this case and Myanmar that is currently before us is what they stated is they asked the court that both states have made submissions to the commission. The commission itself has said it has so much work that you have to take it in turn and it does not look as though that matter will come up before them for another 20 years. In fact, they have enough work where some states who have made submissions will not be heard for 33 years because the commission complains it's short-staffed, it doesn't have permanent members there, and the members complain that they are not paid well enough to be there permanently, so it's going to take a long time. In the meantime, there are suggestions well, Trinidad and Tobago, contact the, the Chinese oil company and tell them, drill, it's yours, and let Barbados file an action and let it come to the court. But it is still, everybody's still very happy. We, Trinidad and Tobago is getting enough oil and gas at the moment, but when the time comes that they need more, then we're going to have to look at the outer limits of the continental shelf. In the meantime, Barbados, um, I don't know where they're going, where they, if they have any rigs out there, um, not as far as I know anyway, if they started offshore, but at the moment, everything seems to be in limbo. I don't think they have started to explore and exploit. Yes?
So I feel we can't end for the override that is eventually. No, not the tribunal can override the arbitral. can override is the submission to the commission on the outer limits of the continental shelf. In other words, if the commission says to Trinidad and Tobago that you have, you end at the triangle, that you are cut off, that you have no rights further than here, this area here, we have asked Trinidad and Tobago to go right out. Trinidad and Tobago can say we're not accepting it. And Barbados, on the other hand, is saying, Trinidad and Tobago, you have no rights out there because of the agreement we have and because of our 200 miles and because of what the CLCS said in our favor. And of course, they use the arbitral award and say, well, look, this is where we, um, we have our shelf up to. Then in those circumstances, all of that would be considered in a decision. But between Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, we've got to stop there. We can't, we can't go and claim areas anywhere beyond that line going this way be against Barbados because that decision is binding between the two states. But on the outer limits, we are really going this way and we are coming into the 200 miles between these two. That secret accord that is now no longer secret that they've signed. Okay? I beg your pardon? Paul is united. You didn't come up. I'm yeah. saying that the animal also called this Imam. If they? I am. Uh huh. And also to call this Imam. Yes. Guyana is, as far as I know, putting forward a similar argument because they have also made a submission to the outer limits of the continent, to the CLCS. And as well, if you go further down, Brazil. But certain states have already objected to Brazil's submission. It's a matter that I don't see it being resolved within the next 15 years because the states are objecting and the, the CLCS is trying its best, but it's not, it's not getting what it wants done. They envisage that when the CLCS makes a recommendation, the state will accept it. And the states are reluctant to do that. That's the impression I'm getting so far. So, we, Trinidad and Tobago, has to be fa have to be faced with Guyana. And it is not reported in the Trinidad and Tobago press, it's reported in the Guyana press that Guyana has made certain objections to Trinidad and Tobago. In other words, Guyana has already indicated to the Ministry of Energy, but to extract any information from the Ministry of Energy or any of them, some most of the ministries, it's like trying to squeeze water out of a stone. They're not going to talk about it. And I don't think they should, because if you are in the realms of negotiations and you talk about it, then people are going to write about it and comment about it and it could create problems in the negotiations. But Guyana has objected to some areas here where Trinidad and Tobago is exploring. They have told them, look, and we know you're there, but we want to file our objection. So I understand unofficially that there are some talks going on between the two. Again, as I say, it is most unfortunate that you raised the point earlier that as CARICOM countries, we can't sort it out in CARICOM. We can't have some means of saying, let us resolve our problems. Because we are all basically one. And I recall, I have very few favorite Calypsonians, most of them who I thought were my best, have gone to the grave, like the mighty spoiler that 
Some of you young people would never know about it. And I've never heard. But you recall what they say makes sense. When um, Black Starling sang, we came here on one ship from the same place. We are all one. We are together. And this is the basis of the Caribbean moving forward. And at the university in Barbados, at um, the carnival competition some 20 years ago, a young Trinidadian girl sang, Caribbean people, we must be together. And everybody cheered and everybody agreed and she got the first prize. And um, she's now in Trinidad once more. And the fact that I'm related to her, I will mention her name. Um, as she said once, that uh, there's a degree of consanguinity between the two of us. So if you're giving a lecture, don't mention that I am your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, this is the new breed. Uh, the new breed of young people who are thinking of unity. Because as I go back to what I said at the beginning, Dr. Eric Williams wrote that if we are together, we can be powerful. And I saw it at the UN. When I was going up for the election, the first thing they asked is, did you get CARICOM support? And when you get CARICOM support, you are looking straight away in the vicinity of nearly 20 votes. Because I had to get to 142, but still. It, 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 once CARICOM goes that way, then GOLAC will come with you. And that's why I think we are basically looking at a close association with our Latin American colleagues. But CARICOM first. Yes, next question. Okay. Um, there's one other point that I wanted to deal with, which was raised by um, which was raised by <coughs> your senior lecturer, Mr. Jaipal Singh. He talked, said, talk about international contracts. Now, we in Trinidad and Tobago, we are entering into a lot of international contracts. International contracts between, not between states, but with international companies multinational companies and Trinidad Tobago, the state itself can enter into a contract with a multinational company and if I may just use an example <coughs> this, was, this was said with tongue in cheek but where I sit among the judges I have the judge from China on one side and the judge from India on the other side and coming to sit between us was the distinguished judge from Senegal. And he walked in the morning and he said, ah, Judge Lucky, you are on the other side. And here am I sitting between the two most powerful economies in the world, India and China. Both of the judges quietly put their head down and we all looked in the direction of the judge from the United States. And nobody said anything. But we have to face that. There are two powerful economies now. Everybody is trying to trade with them. And they are trying to trade with everybody because the largest rig in the world is now offshore Brazil. And that's Chinese. Um, the Chinese, as I understood, I don't know, they were trying to get a contract with Trinidad and Tobago to go into the Atlantic. They have been able because <coughs> of their links to get a contract with the Cuban government. So the question is, how do you resolve a dispute between an international company or a state international company and your state? But in Trinidad and Tobago, we are entering into agreements with the various companies, and if you can go back and just show uh, why I'm still talking, the, the um, what I call the, the map, yes. the, not the old, the new, upstream. 
if you look at the upstream map closely, and it's shown there, you will see that the areas that are leased, who they are leased to. And you will see a lot of, like oh, Trinma, that's ours, and the Repsol, well known. You have Repsol in this area, and then you have these various blocks, which Repsol is here, Chevron is there. So naturally, when they lease, they are leasing this area or entering into agreement that they will exploit. And in the agreement, if they are able to explore what happens. Because once they are extracting oil, then we make our revenue, and I'm speaking here as a, Trinid as a Trinbegonian, I've been corrected a few times, as a Trinbegonian, we are getting considerable revenue. That's where it's coming from. Oil and gas, and of course the downstream industries. We would enter into a contract for a lease. The question is, and it was posed by your senior lecturer, Mr. Jai Paul Singh, that he says, what happens if there's a disagreement, if there's a dispute? Now, usually, if, as lawyers, and you will, may have to do that in due course, you're entering into such a contract, you will specifically state the law that is to be applicable. So you have long arguments. For example, if it's United States, we want United States law. And then if it's China, they will say, well, look, what law are we going to apply? They can even say, if the host country says, as happened, we want you to apply the law of Trinidad and Tobago, and the other side says, no, we want you to apply this law, then you can agree in the contract what law you will use. You can even say principles of international law. And then if there's a dispute be in here between <coughs> a multinational company and a state, it will not come to us. In the contract, you will state what the law is. Will it be the law of the host country? Or will it be by arbitration? So they usually set up a clause in the agreement and um, if we pull up quickly the unitization agreement, you will see how Venezuela handled it. Um, the framework, framework tricky. Um, this. Okay, if you scroll right down to the end. If you go back up, right. It tells you what each can do. If you go further up now, that's duration and termination. You'll see, hold on. The criminal law of each party shall apply in respect of acts or omissions committed. And then they tell you what each party shall ex exercise civil and jurisdiction in respect of acts. And in the exercise of jurisdiction, what will happen? If you go further up, you will see um, Again, yes, hold it. I think this would answer um, almost say Dr. Franz, Mr. Jaipur Singh's question. The party shall encourage the prompt settlement of any dispute arising of the interpretation through consultation or negotiation by a steering committee, in the first instance, or by a ministerial commission. So you have that right. Any dispute arising shall be settled amicably by direct consultation or negotiation between the parties. That is how Venezuela approaches it. Now, a similar clause can be drafted that the same thing, any dispute arising out of this shall be settled by arbitration. Or, um, the, 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 of course, you registered with the United Nations, but the dispute resolution clause is always the clause that's going to tell you how you <coughs> resolve a dispute. So when such a contract is being um, concluded or drafted, then the draftspersons 
You don't say trust men anymore. Apparently, I've been corrected. You say trust persons. Um, but in the interpretation act, it say the male includes the females. If I say trust when I need ladies as well. Um, well, Parliament can do anything except change a man into a woman or vice versa. But the what specifically happens here is that in the dispute resolution, when you draft the contract, it is extremely important how or what you say. Because if you don't put it in the contract and the party signs and things happen, the first thing they will do is criticize the lawyers. And one of the main points they ask in all international contracts, the first question is what is the applicable law? And the second question is, what is the law to be applied in the event of a dispute? And the third question they ask is, how are we going to do it? And they usually follow what is set up in the all disputes resolutions, is you try to encourage settlement. In international matters, you do everything to encourage settlement by negotiation, by conciliation, by the appointment of, an, of a conciliator. Um, the, all the methods are set out there by negotiation. It's only when all of that fails. You know, you meet and in international contracts and so you don't, you don't see any of them the right to strike. So, you know, um, that, that will not be applicable. Of course, the workers can strike and jump off the, the rig and say, not working. But they will also put in a clause that if in one of these which involve, of course, oil and gas, they will put in, in the event of an act of God or in the event of an industrial dispute, who pays because you're going to be losing money. So <laughs> every method is used. And anybody who's in, this is, by the way, Orbiter Dicta, Anybody who's involved in negotiations, you will go through this whole process before you take action. I see nothing more. Um, <laughs> before you take action, and then you, which could involve everything. For example, if I had no gas in my car, I would not have been able to come and deliver the lecture today. <laughs> so, the but this is the important part in international contracts. So an international contract must be carefully vetted by your lawyers. They will charge high fees, but it pays off in the long run. It's better you pay the lawyer high fee than suffer the consequences of losses in the long run. Um, is that sufficient? For that. Um, I did have any other matters, but I was asked whether I could shut down about 12 o'clock was when you hold the mic to speak, you'll hear your stomach growling. But I'm quite willing, before I conclude, to hear any questions that you may wish to ask. Yes. Small states that have 
any kind of impact upon the operations and the way they treat the small states within which they are operated, even though they have entered into contact perhaps with another entity in the state. And the last area I want you to address is the fact because right, right seven miles across the Gulf, we have seen Chavez from time to time getting angry with a lot of multinational corporations. The next thing you hear, they are appropriated or nationalized. And in the case of that kind of nationalization, what sort of remedy is there for those who have suffered that type of uh, appropriation? Let me start first of all. Some years ago at the United Nations, it was found that the small states, so I'm taking it from there, that the small states, to use a better word, were discriminated against, that they were losing out on everything. So they formed a committee which still exists. This is the Committee of Small States. And they set out what the size should be, and they meet as small states, and each state can give its grievance, and the whole group stands up for that small state. The second thing is that when you have contracts with multinationals, so I'm going backwards, like what Senor Chavez did, and he nationalized, you would have seen that the multinational company asked for compensation. Now he is the president of the country. And if he nationalizes and he says, I am not paying you one cent because what you've been taking out, you made, ma I think this was his answer, you made massive profits from resources that belong to the people of Venezuela, then I am not paying you because you made enough money. The multinational corporation has to quietly leave. But what they usually do is you have, as you know, um, the multinationals do have directors, but you have a sort of vested interest in it. And they can get together and say, we are not going to make any more investments in your country. And therefore pressurize you into giving some form of compensation. But the competition among these international, multinational corporations is such that it's a sort of situation of, uh, to use local powers, dog eat dog and survival of the fittest. So you lose out there. The first point you made was, just remind me, the, I'm going from the last to the top. Memorandum of, understanding. Memorandum of understanding. Now, it depends on how it is drafted. Because in a memorandum of understanding, it's a sort of gentleman's agreement. And it is said that gentleman's agreements are often the subject matter of prolonged litigation. So you have a memorandum of understanding and one side says this memorandum of understanding has been followed for a number of years, therefore it, it has the effect of a contract because of what you set out there. And although it was just a gentleman's agreement, we have now found that this has the force of a contract. And usually a judge is called upon to say well, is this simply a gentleman's agreement or has it the effect of a contract? Compared now to, there are two choices you would have. Enter into a memorandum of understanding where we say this is what we would do and this is what we not do and this is what we carry out. Or a specific contract with specific principles and items set out therein that if either side infringes, then you have a right to take them to court or you have a right to damages in those circumstances. So to put it simply, 
a lot of people prefer a contract to a memorandum of understanding because a memorandum of understanding does not have to use the word that clout or that legal effect as a contract so for example we can enter into a memorandum of understanding that you know with respect to the use of a car or things like that but well, that might be a bad example you get into a contract but you a memorandum of understanding is usually respecting the rights of the others whereas a contract not only respects it says specifically if the rights of a contract are infringed what happens so it is much better to have a contract a memorandum of understanding well we know each other very well from presentation college, so we can have a memorandum of understanding if we enter into a contract as to what will happen because you won't sue me, I won't sue you, and I won't do anything wrong. That's nice. We just have something in writing that we will follow. But if you have a contract, then there are contractual obligations and you are bound by the law of contract and that law will be applicable in those circumstances. Okay. Yes? I don't know if the professor wants to ask me a question, it will be hard. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Justice Lucky very much for his presence here and his for clarification on the topics that he covered. Um, I want to call on Nishka, who is the chairman of the SPE student chapter, to do a vote of thanks to Justice Lucky. Good day to everyone, students, members of faculty, specially invited guests. A special good day to our guest of honor, His Excellency Justice Lucky. On behalf of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I would like to thank you for agreeing to be a guest lecturer today for our contract law and negotiations class. Without a doubt, I can say that everyone here now has a clear understanding of the laws of the sea and international contracts. We have all walked away today with a new piece of information. Members of the university present here today are indeed privileged to be in the presence of such a distinguished son of the soil. I would also like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to enlighten those present here today about the laws governing the sea of our country. We would now like to take the opportunity to present you with tokens of appreciation from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. I would also like to call uh, Justice Lucky's brother, Andrew, and his wife to the podium, please.